Hello everybody and welcome to an Unreal Engine 4 tutorial. Uh, today I'm going to be showing you how to make a functioning door in Unreal Engine using the Blueprint system. So first of all, we are going to want to create a few different uh, assets. We're going to need our door blueprint itself and we're also going to generate an input key uh, to be able to interact with the door as well. So let's start by making the door. Uh, so what I've got here is a first person shooter template and I have got the starter content enabled. OK, so you need to make sure you've got that if you're going to follow along with this tutorial. Um, alternatively, you could bring in some of your own assets as well. Uh, but I'm just going to be using the starter content. Right. So what I'd like you to do first is go into the first person BP folder and then into the blueprints folder. So I'm going to try and keep everything organized. So in here, I would like you to right click in a blank space down here. And you'll see you get the context menu here where you can add in uh, new elements such as blueprints, a new level materials etc we are going to add in a blueprint class and on this blueprint class these are all the different types of blueprint you can add you can also search for many many more types down here but we just want an actor blueprint so as you can see here an actor is an object that can be placed or spawned in the world so that's what we want i'm going to click on actor and you'll see it creates a new blueprint down here and it is asking us to give it a name so i'm going to call mine door underscore BP for blueprint and hit enter and now we've got this new file here double click it to open it up and you'll see this opens the default blueprint editor now we need several things in here uh, in order to be able to make a functioning door uh, so at the minute our blueprint is just this empty space this white circle here this sphere does not appear in the world at all this is just like a reference marker for where the center of the world space is so you can see the green and red lines crossing there that is the center of the blueprint scene that's all that white sphere is that won't be there when we finish um okay so first of all we need to use the add component button up here so click on add component and we need to add in a static mesh so scroll down till you find static mesh you can also search in the search bar there and that gives you anything that's got the word static in it. We need a static mesh. So make sure it's this one with like a little, the symbol looks a little bit like a small house or a shed. Uh, click on that. And that will import a static mesh item. Uh, and of course, I want you to rename this as well. We're not just going to leave it as static mesh. So please rename this to something such as door frame. Because this is what is going to be our door frame. So add door frame. And at the minute, we have no static mesh applied to this. It's currently got nothing, which is why we're still just seeing this white sphere. What I'd like you to do is over on the right side of the screen, where it says static mesh, you can click on the drop down and go down until you find, might be quick to search for it actually, look for the word frame, and you should see SM underscore door frame. Okay, so that means static mesh underscore door frame. Click on that to add it in. And you should see it then pops in. OK. At the minute, it doesn't appear to have its usual texture on it. But I think that's just because the shaders haven't compiled yet. Um, but yes, yeah, so we've got this door frame. This is the door frame that's included with starter content. OK. So we've got a door frame. But now we need an actual door as well. So I'm going to click on Add Component. I'm going to add another static mesh. And I'm going to call this one Door. And then in the static mesh selector over on the right, I'm going to click the drop down. And I'm going to search for door and choose the one that is called SM underscore door. OK, and then that pops the door into the scene. Again, it's compiling the shaders. So that's why we've just got this gray checkered pattern at the moment. Once that's loaded, it should be uh, looking a bit more door like with some glass panels and things. Um, so the first thing you'll notice when we load this in is it's obviously in the wrong place. It's sat halfway through the door frame and that's not obviously what we want. So. Uh, we need to move it across. Now, I can just move it with the arrows here, but I can't quite get it right. Look, see, it's there. It's It's got a little gap this side. If I move it there, then it has a little gap on this side. So that's not ideal. However, up here, these tools here are all different types of snapping tool. OK, so uh, you've got your there you move rotate and scale tools there. But then here you've got this is your movement snapping. As you can see, it's turned on. So if it's colored in orange, it's turned on. And you have a drop down here, which tells you how much to snap by. So currently it's set by 10. So I'm going to set that to 5. And then 
now I should be able to just nudge it across because now it's only moving it by five units and now it is now perfectly matched into the door frame. You do also have rotational snapping as well, which is currently turned on at 10 degrees per uh, rotation. So when you try and rotate, it will snap it 10 degrees every time. Uh, and you also have scale snapping, which is this last one here. And that's going to scale by 0.25 every time you scale something. We're not going to be using those uh, in this uh, example, though. OK, so now we've got ourselves a door, um, a door frame and a door. And you'll notice that the door static mesh is sort of indented slightly on this list. OK, and that means that the door is parented to the door frame. So if I was to click on the door frame and move it, the door moves with it. OK. So anywhere the door frame will move, the door will move with it, which is fine. OK, we still need another component, though. So this physically uh, appearance wise, this is all we need. Just a door frame and a door. That's fine. But we still need something to be able to interact with the door. The door needs to know when the player is near it uh, so that it, so it can receive input from the player. Uh, so we need to go to add component. And if you just search for box, you should see the option for a box collision. OK, so I'm going to click on box collision and add that in and you'll see it adds it here. Uh, I'm going to call this. Uh, I'm just going to call it trigger uh, for now because there is basically a, going to be a trigger box. So once the player is within this box, they will be able to interact with the door and open it. So um, now you also need to make sure that you've got your items in the list like I do here. You see how door and trigger are both at the same level, like trigger isn't indented at all and door doesn't have one of these little white triangles here. Um, so make sure that this is not like that. Make sure it's not like that, because if it is like that, what will happen is when the door opens, if I just demonstrate by rotating the door, if I rotate the door, the trigger box, as you can see there, the trigger box also opens with it, which is not good because it means that when you the player is like on this side of the door if they're stood here and the door is open they're not actually going to be within the trigger box and not they're not going to be able to open the door okay so we need to make sure that trigger is not parented to the door so you can do that by just clicking and dragging it up onto door and it will unparent okay we need to uh, move and position the trigger box a bit better though because at the minute it's just down there which means the player is going to have to get right up close um, and they're only going to be touching it if their feet are basically inside the box. So that's not ideal. So what I'd like you to do is using the move tool, move the box upwards till it's around the middle of the door, somewhere like that and be fine. And if you look over on the side here, you've got this these options here called box extent and it's currently set to 32 by 32 by 32. Uh, we're going to just customize these a bit. So I want you to make in the X, make it stick out a bit further. Let's have a look at that. Let's make it 100 in X. And then the Y, I'm going to make that into uh, about 70. So it's just a bit wider than the door, as you can see there. Um, the height shouldn't matter as much uh, because of the, as long as the character is like stood within this box, they'll be fine. But just to be extra safe, let's, uh, let's click and drag that up a bit. Uh, yeah, let's make it, let's round it off to 90. OK, so now uh, our box should be like this. So it sticks out when you look at it from the side. It sticks out either side of the door. That means the player will be able to interact with it, whether they are on this side of the door or this side. Uh, and then also it's just slightly wider than the door. It means they can still interact with it if they just stood slightly to the side as well. OK, but if they're too far to the side, they can't interact, which is fine. Right. So now we've got our trigger in place we now need to actually start doing a bit of code for this okay so first of all we're going to need to make sure that the door can receive input from the player so what that means is when the player is within this box if they press a certain button we want to make sure the door recognizes that the player has pressed that button and then perform the certain action which should be opening or closing so we need to do that first so in the event graph so here you've got viewport construction script and event graph. So go to the event graph tab, and this is the view where you'll be doing most of your uh, blueprint editing. This is where you put all your code, essentially. Now, it always gives you these three nodes here by default. We're actually not gonna use these ones, so you can actually just drag a box over them, left click and drag, and then just delete. Get rid of those, okay? So now what we're gonna need to do is add an event for this trigger box. So if you select the trigger box here on the left-hand side, 
And then over in the details panel on the right, if you scroll down, you should see a load of green buttons. Now, these are all different events that can be uh, triggered associated with this box. So I'm going to add a begin overlap event. So if you look here, it's the second one down on component begin overlap. I want to click on that. So this event means when something in the game world goes into that trigger box, this event will fire. OK, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's as, as long as it's uh, got the right type of collision uh, on it, it will detect that it's passed through it and it will activate this this node. OK, we are also going to need an end overlap as well. So while I'm here, I'm just going to click on trigger again. And over on the right hand side, I'm going to go down to end overlap. So it's the one just below the one we added before. So on component end overlap. And I'm going to click and add that in as well. OK. And this does the same thing, except this fires once something leaves the trigger box. OK, so this will be used to detect when the player is basically out of range of the door. Um, so first thing we need to do, though, on the begin overlap section, we're going to start by detecting the player walking into the box. So the first thing we need to do is actually check that it is the player that's overlapping. And the best way to do that is to use this output here called other actor. If You click and drag. And then it will give you a context menu that pops down. And if you search for cast to first person character, you see there, cast to first person character, add that in. Now, casting to first person character, what this does is it goes and looks at the first person character blueprint and sort of says, hey, was that you that just overlapped me? Um, if it was, it will fire off of this pin. If it wasn't the player, it will fire off of this pin. OK. So this is just a, a nice, easy way of checking what has overlapped and if, it, if the player has overlapped with this trigger box or not. OK, if it was the player, what we want it to do is start looking for input from the player. So if we drag off this white pin here and search for enable input. And you'll see here we've got this enable input node and it has two pins. It's got a target and it's got a player controller input. Now, the target we can leave as self because it's the, the door is the thing that we want to be receiving input from the player. So leave that as self player controller, though. We do need to get a reference to the player controller. So I'm going to drag off of player controller and just simply type in get player controller. And that will add in this get player controller node. OK, for the ending overlap event, it's basically exactly the same, except for the last node. The last node is going to be a disable input instead. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab this cast to node uh, and it's so instead of creating it again, I'm just going to duplicate this one. Now to duplicate a node, it is control and W on the keyboard and that will automatically copy and paste the node. You can also do control C and then click somewhere and do control V and that will paste it as well. But control W just copies and pastes it in one action. And then what you need to do is make sure that first of all, you connect the white cable. This is the, called the execute. Uh, cable the execute pin connect those up across there otherwise this will not fire the white put with the white wires are basically like power uh, if it was an electrical circuit so if these aren't connected these nodes are not getting any kind of power they won't fire um, the other thing we need to do is connect other actor into object okay so whenever you do a cast to node the object pin has to have something plugged into it otherwise it just will not work okay so other actor is what we're plugging into there and off of this pin here, I'm going to then search for disable input. And there it is, disable input. Like I say, it looks pretty much the same as that node above. And instead of creating a new get player controller node, I can actually just use this one as well. So if I click on the pin here and drag and plug it into player controller, and there we go. That means I don't need to use two pins, uh, two different nodes, sorry. Okay, so now we've got this. This will basically detect when the player walks into the box or when anything walks into the box this will fire it will check to see if it's the player if it is it will start looking for player input um, and then when the player leaves the box or anything else leaves the box it will fire this event again check to see if it's the player that's left the box and if it is it will disable input and stop looking for any input from the player okay so now we need to uh little handy little thing actually is to comment uh put little comment boxes on this so you know what it does okay so we can highlight all these nodes click and drag over them if you press the c key on the keyboard that will bring up a comment box okay and on this comment box you can type in something like uh, enable input if player 
is within trigger box. And there we go, and that just gives us a little comment. In case your blueprints get quite complex and you have loads of loads and loads of different little bits of blueprint code on one screen, these comment boxes are really helpful for keeping track of what code is what. So now I can see this is the code that enables the input if the player is within the trigger box. Um, okay, so that's done now. However, we do need to set up uh, the player actually having an interact button uh, so that they can interact with the door. The problem we have at the minute is we don't we haven't set that up. So I could just use an actual key. So let's, for example, say the E key. So if I search for E key and then try and find it in the list. Here's the key bindings. Uh, so if I look for E, there it is. So so this is fine. I can do all the code off of this. Uh, but the only problem is it will only work if I use that exact key, that E key. So what I'm going to do is show you how to create a new input, uh, like a new key binding input, which means that you can assign different keys to be the interact button, uh, as well as different types of controllers. So if you want to use, if you want to set up keyboard controls as well as a gamepad, uh, you'll be able to do that. So what I'd like you to do, first of all, is just click on the compile button here. And this checks the code to make sure there's no obvious errors. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll demonstrate what that looks like. For example, if I disconnect this wire, uh, so there's now nothing plugged into object. If I hit compile, it's now going to say, oh, error. I, I don't know what you what you want me to check this against. OK, so just make sure that that's plugged in. So check for any errors. Compile. If you get a green tick, then it should be all good. OK. Now, what I'd like you to do is come out of the door blueprint. So I've just clicked, clicked on the tab and dragged it away. And then I'm like redocking it to the top there. And come back to your main editor window. OK, which looks like this. Uh, and I would like you to go to settings and then go to project settings. And give that a moment to open. OK, in the project settings, we want to find the section called input. So if you scroll down a bit down the left hand side here, you should find input. Click on that. And in here you will see engine input and then in the section called bindings, this is where we can basically set up a control scheme. So there's already one in here if you're using the first person shooter template. You've got action mappings and access mappings here. I'm going to open both of these out so you can see them. Um, so these are all the key bindings that have already been set up. So for example, jump, if I click the little triangle, jump has got a lot of different keys binded to it. So I could use the space bar. I could use the gamepad face button bottom, which would be the uh, A button on an Xbox controller or the X button on a PlayStation controller. Um, a daydream. I'm not actually sure what that is. That's quite new. Uh, Vive left trigger. So on a Vive controller using left trigger, etc. I'm not going to go through all these. Um, but yeah, you can basically assign loads of different buttons uh, on different input devices to do the same action. So that's the jump feature there. Uh, I'm going to add in a new action mapping. So because we're going to use a, we're going to make an interact button. Okay, which we're going to be able to use to like open doors. But in other tutorials, we might use it to uh, to pick up items or switch on lights or something like that as well. So click on the add action mappings. And what I'd like you to do there is rename that to interact. And then choose keys of your own, uh, you know, whatever keys you like. I'm going to use the E key for the keyboard input. So I'm going to scroll down the keyboard inputs and click on E. I'm also just just to demonstrate, I'm also going to add a gamepad button as well. So I'm going to click on the little plus icon here to add another input and you'll see it's added a new one. Click on the drop down and go to gamepad and let's say uh, I'm going to use face button left gamepad face button left. So that would be the X button on an Xbox controller. OK, so we've added those in now, whenever you do anything in the project settings, whenever you change anything in the project settings, it will automatically save it. So you don't need to. There's no save button or anything in these properties. Just once you've changed it, that's it. It's changed. Um, so you can just close the project settings window now. OK, what I'd like you to do is go back to your door BP. So click on door BP. And back to make sure you're on the event graph as well. And into a blank space on the event graph, I am going to right click. And if we search for interact, which is what we called that input, you'll now see it shows up here under action events. It says interact. If I click on that. You can now see input action interact and it's got pressed and released. So it looks pretty much the same as that key when I did the E key thing. 
Oops. In spell. E key. So if I add that in again. So you see they're very similar nodes. It's just that this one's got a longer title on it. Okay, they've got the exact same outputs on. But this one will only work if it's the E key specifically that's pressed. This one will work if it's the E key or if it's the gamepad face button left. So this this basically saves you having to have multiple lines of code and multiple inputs and things like that. Okay, so we have input action interact here. This is where we need to actually start getting the door to move. But we're also going to need uh, a variable to check whether the door is open or closed and things like that. So I'm going to show you how to create a new variable. Uh, so over on this side, see add variable. I'm going to click on that button and it adds in a new one on the list here and automatically uh, prompts you to rename it. So I'm going to call this one door is open. I'm going to use capital letters at the start of each word. Door is open. That is what I'm going to call that blueprint, uh, that variable. I'm going to click compile. And now when I've clicked compile, you can see over on the right here, I can now edit the value of door is open. This is a Boolean variable, which basically means it's either true or false. So that's why when you get this, the only option is to either turn it on or off with this tick box. OK, so what we're going to do is when we press the interact button, the first thing we're going to do is check the status of door is open. We're going to check whether that is true or false. OK, so to do that, I'm going to drag off and I'm going to search for a branch. So drag off of pressed and search for branch. And this is a branch node. And as you can see, it's got a red input, OK, which is a condition that is a Boolean variable. So it can only check Booleans. Uh, and this will check whether the Boolean is true or false. And depending on which one it is, it will fire off one of these wires, OK? But we need to actually make sure that it's checking our variable that we just made. So easiest way to do that is to simply click and drag it from the left. And if you hover your mouse just over that, look, you see it sort of highlights and you get this green tick. If I let go now, it automatically connects it for me. OK, so this is going to check the condition of door is open, whether it's true or false. Now, to begin with, the door is going to be closed, which means the first time that this runs, it's going to run off false because the door is shut. So we need to first of all start with this code. So I'm going to drag off of false. And I'm going to search for a move component to node. So search for move component to and add that in. Now this node is a, a newer ish feature in Unreal. Um, we previously used to have to do this thing where we created a animation timeline and used a graph and things like that to get this kind of movement. Now we don't need to do that. This move component two has it all kind of built in, which is very, very handy. So what it will do is it will move the component from wherever it currently is, and it will then move in a relative fashion, uh, location and rotation that we put in here. OK, so whatever we put in, it's going to move it from where it is to these coordinates here in a local sense. OK, so it's not going to do it in a world sense. So at the minute, it won't move it at all because these are all set to zero, um, but it, it, it won't move it in the world anywhere. It will stay local to where it is. So we need to decide where to move it or how much to move it by. Now, actually, there is one little difference. This if currently this will actually move the door like in a sliding fashion uh, at the moment, because Y is going to zero. If I click on the door itself over here and look at the coordinates, the location coordinates, X, Y, and Z, you see the Y has got 45 in it. So what that would do currently is it will move the door from 45 in the Y and it will actually move it to zero in the Y. So what will happen is the door will slide in the Y axis. Um, so we don't want that. So we need to actually make sure we put 45 in the Y bit there. OK, so put 45 in the Y bit there and press enter to just to confirm the input. But the other main thing we need to do, obviously, this is going to be this is your traditional door that, that swings open. OK, so we need to actually put in a rotation. So we've got X, Y and Z. Uh, these two X and Y are going to rotate the door in the wrong way. OK, they, they will like tip the door downwards or, uh, or or make the door like roll sideways. So we don't want that. We actually want the door to swing on its hinges, basically. So the Z axis is the one that we want to be able to do that. Uh, so what you need to do is put in a certain value in here. Now we could go with 90, which means the door would open exactly 90 degrees. Um, I kind of like to do it just slightly over 90, uh, probably more like 100 degrees. 
So I'm going to put in 100 in the Z axis there. Um, you also have these bits here. You've got ease out and ease in. Okay, and these basically just make the animation a bit smoother. So without these on, it would move very, it would move at the same speed constantly from start to finish, which looks very, uh, very robotic. So if we put in ease in and ease out, it will sort of move a bit slower, a bit smoother as it opens at slightly different rates. So it doesn't look like it's just been mechanically opened. Um, okay, then over time, this is how long you want it to take to go from where it currently is to then being in the open position to, to these coordinates. Um, so over time is currently 0.2. That's very fast for a door to open, 0.2 seconds. That, that, that's a bit too quick. Um, so I think we need at least one second. So let's just let's just put in one in there. Okay. And the one thing that we also need to do here is you'll notice there's a component input here. And this is basically saying what what component do you want me to move? So currently there's nothing plugged into it, so it doesn't know which thing we want it to move. So what you need to do is get door over here on the left and click and drag onto component. And that will attach door to component. So now it knows it wants us to move the door. Okay, and that's fine. There's one more thing we need to do on this line of code here though, and that is to check when the animation is completed, when the door is fully open, we need to set this variable of door is open. Uh, we need to change that to be true because the door would then be open. So the easiest way to do that is if you click and drag from door is open, click and drag it into your blueprint and let go, and you'll get two options. You get get door is open, which is basically what this one here is, uh, but we actually want a set door is open. So click on set door is open and you see it looks slightly different. It's actually got a tick box in it and also an input there for the execute pin. So plug the execute pin across and then with door is open, make sure that is then set to true. So tick the box, okay? So now the first time that we go up to the door, we press it, it will check if door is open is false, which it should be by default uh, and it will run this code swing the door open and then set door is open to true. So the next time we press it, it should then do it the opposite way. Okay, so I'm then going to uh, replicate this code for opening. So you should actually be able to just copy these nodes. So highlight them all and do control W, move them up to here, connect true into the move. But what we're actually gonna do here is keep Y on 45, otherwise, that's going to make the door slide, but the rotation we want to set back to zero. So set the rotation back to zero. And then also on the set door is open node, turn that back to false. Okay. So that should now work. I'm going to click compile. Uh, I'm also just going to quickly save that and back into the main editor. The one thing we haven't done actually is put the door into the world. So I'm going to click on door and I'm going to drag that into the level. The door is now in the world. Okay. Now the good thing about doing a blueprint is you can have all that code that we've just made and make a door open and close and things. You can also copy uh, blueprints so that you don't need to constantly re uh, repeat making them and stuff. So if you hold Alt and left click and drag, look, it will make a copy. That's really handy as well. But we don't need copies, we just need the one door. Okay, so I'm now going to click on play and I'm going to move around in my world and I'm going to walk up to the door and I'm going to press the E key and the door swings open. That's successful. Okay, and I can't walk through the door at the minute. That's another issue I'm going to show you in a sec, uh, but I should be able to close the door as well. Okay, so it opens and it closes. And when you press it, sort of, if you spam the key at the moment, it does kind of like stop in its tracks a little bit. Uh, we'll look at fixing that later on as well. Okay, so now we've got the door opening and closing. That's fine. There's just a few little tweaks, uh, such as not being able to fit through the door, uh, So the, which is what that problem was. Um, so let's go back into the door BP and into the viewport. And if we click on the door frame and then swap to the scale tool, so which is that one there or R on the keyboard. And we're just going to scale the door up a bit. So I'm going to put my cursor just there on the white, on the white box there and just oh, wrong way. Just going to scale the door up a bit. Actually, I'm just going to make it wider. Let's, let's use the green handle there. Just make it a bit wider. Click compile. I'm going to go back into my level. Hit play and I'm going to open the door. Close, open. All right, I'm going to walk through. Yes, I can walk through it. Now, there is one more issue uh, with this. So I can walk through the door, but 
I can walk through the door when it's closed as well. And that is simply because the starter content door, for some reason, doesn't have a collision box on it. Uh, I don't know why this is, but still, we can fix that. So, what we need to do is, yeah, fix uh, this, this door uh, collision. So, to do that, I want you to go into starter content at the bottom, go into the content folder. So, if you just click there on content, and then go to starter content, then go to props. And in this section of folders here, you'll see this is where the door frame and the door are. The door frame does have a collision, so that's fine. It's just the door that doesn't. So if you double click on the door, it will open it up. OK, and we can now see the static mesh here. If we go to collision at the top here and turn on simple collision, we don't see anything. And that's because it doesn't have a collision box. So we need to add one in. So luckily, because this is a very simple object, we can make one very, very quickly. We just go to collision up here on the very, very top and find add box simplified collision. We add that in. And what that does is it scans the, the shape of the model and sizes a box, a wireframe box around it. So from this side, the wireframe box pretty much fits the door perfectly, uh, which is fine. From the side, however, it's a, the trigger box looks a little bit too wide. And that's because it's took the door handle into account as well, which I don't think it really needs to do that. So if you just click on the wireframe box, uh, you'll see that you can actually move and scale and rotate it and things. So if you just scale it inwards a little bit. Now, if your scale snapping is on like mine is, you're going to need to turn that off. So go up to here, where it's the scale snap tool. Click on that little icon. There's an arrow with a dot at the end of it. Click on that. Now scale snapping is off and I can move my scales a lot freely, uh, a lot more freely. So if I scale that down to this about the same width as the door, it doesn't have to be absolutely pixel perfect, but as long as it's close enough, it might be a tiny bit too thin. Get it to about there. Okay. So now that coll uh, collision box there is pretty much the right size, the exact size for the door. Uh, so I'm just going to click save. And I'm going to close this window. OK, I'm also just going to save that blueprint. And let's just go back in here and play again. That's it. So now I can't walk through the door. I can open it. I can walk through. I'm still getting, I'm actually getting wedged on the, uh, the side of the door collision now. So I need to make the door a little bit wider. Let's go back to door blueprint and make it a bit wider again. It's starting to look a little bit oddly proportioned now, but like I say, when you make your own doors, oh, apologies, forgot the sound was on there. Uh, if you make the door yourself using your own models and things, you can all, you can just make sure you make it the right size for the player to fit through. Yes, there we go. Now I can fit through the door just fine. Okay, and there we have it. There is a functioning door. The only issue we've got here is the animation uh, sort of triggers a bit funny if you spam the key. OK, so but that's something we'll look at in another video. So for now, I'm going to wrap it up there. So thank you very much for watching. I hope this really helped uh, and I will see you in the next video.